like to welcome everyone to this press conference. <coughs> My name is Daryl Liu, and uh, I'm a member of the uh, I'm a member of the Hassan Diab Support Committee. Uh, bonjour, je vous, uh, je vous accueille ici aujourd'hui. Je suis en contact. Vous êtes ici avec nous autres. Is there a sound problem? I have people. Do you want me to speak louder? Much louder? Yes. I think the mic is not. No, it's just speak louder. Yeah. Okay, then I'll speak louder. All right, so thank you so much for joining us today. Um, so I'll just let you know how the press conference will um, take place. Alors, je, je, je vais juste vous dire un peu comment uh, la conférence de presse va se dérouler. Et ensuite, uh, on va avoir nos, nos trois conférenciers. So first of all, um, I'm going to uh, introduce each of the speakers. There are three of them. Uh, and afterwards, I'll give a brief uh, summary of their statement. speakers, I'd like to read a very brief statement by Rania Fali, uh, Hassan's wife. It is devastating to see an innocent person deprived of his liberty and freedom based on deeply flawed, very problematic, and totally absurd handwriting analysis. This ordeal has caused considerable personal pain and financial burden. I very much support Hassan and his quest to never give up until this injustice is rectified and he clears his name. Maintenant, en français. Il est terrible de voir une personne innocente privée de sa liberté et de la liberté fondée sur une analyse graphologique profondément viciée, très problématique et totalement absurde. Cette preuve a suscité une douleur personnelle et la charge financière Je suis très favorable qu'Assane et sa quête de ne jamais donner jusqu'à cette euh, excuse de, de ne se jamais donner à cette injustice soit corrigée. Il et il lave son nom. Okay. So that was a statement by Rania Tafali. Then annoncé par Rania Tafali, la l'épouse de Hassan. And the first speaker for the press conference is uh, Hassan Diab's lawyer, Donald Bain. So I'll give up the floor to. Uh, Mr. Bain. Regrettably, the experience of this case in particular demonstrates how very, very unfair the current state of Canadian extradition law is. Because there was in this case overwhelming and uncontradicted evidence of the unreliability of the key French handwriting evidence on which the committal for extradition was based. Yet the extradition judge felt powerless in his role as an extradition judge to do anything about it. This is the third attempt by France. This latest handwriting report is not the first, not the second, it's the third attempt to get a handwriting report before this Canadian court. The first two attempts ended in failure when it turned out that the sample handwriting being used by those two supposed French experts, the sample handwriting was actually written not by Hassan Diab, but by somebody else. So the comparison that these 
people claimed proved Hassan Diab wrote the five block printed words on a hotel card in Paris in 1980 was written by somebody else. Faced with that embarrassing evidence, France withdrew those two handwriting reports and substituted instead a third. This third report, three leading experts from around the world, experts in handwriting, methodology, and comparison analysis, said was wholly, patently, and completely unreliable because it used the wrong methodology. And to put it in lay terms, it's like trying to use the methodology to build an asphalt plant to build a nuclear reactor. It simply doesn't produce a reliable result if you use the wrong methodology. And the latest French expert evidence that she had little knowledge of appropriate methodology in conducting a handwriting analysis and all of the experts said as a result her reports are totally discredited. This man therefore is being extradited on unreliable evidence, exactly what the Supreme Court of Canada intended in its decision in 2006 in Ferris not happen to Canadians. It's happening to this Canadian. And while this irony of repeated unreliable evidence justifying committal keeps being used, it turns out that Dr. Diab won't even be effectively able to challenge these defective handwriting, French handwriting reports in France because they weren't produced by the investigating magistrate. The premise of the Canadian judge is all this Canadian sponsored evidence will find its way to the French trial court who will consider it and find, as he said in his judgment today, he would clearly not find this reasonable, cap reasonably capable of supporting a conviction. He says, assuming a fair trial, it's unlikely a conviction will result in this case. Yet a Canadian's losing his liberty and going to be shipped to France. And the cruel irony is he will not have his evidence judged by the same standard because the French in their system do not regard defense evidence as reliable. What an irony. And thirdly, there's an added factor to the, to the tragedy of this case. Once in France, France will use unsourced, uncircumstanced, secret, anonymous intelligence to convict Hassan Diab. It was not used here once the defective handwriting analysis was allowed to be entered because the judge wouldn't have allowed it. But in France it's used. It's untestable. It's unchallengeable. You can't make a defense against it because you don't know where it comes from or exactly what it is. So the real tragedy of this case is wholly unreliable evidence is being used to gain extradition, to get the man to France, and once there, he's going to have a trial based on secret intelligence. How unjust is that? C'était l'avocat de Asadia, M. Donald Bain. Alors, je vais faire un petit compte rendu, juste une minute, une traduction en français. Puis, euh, ensuite, on va aller à, au prochain conférencier. Alors, M. Bain a discuté de l'état de la loi sur l'extradition. En effet, il a dit que cette affaire démontre, en particulier, la nature très, très injuste de la loi sur l'extradition du Canada par la façon que cette loi-là a été interprétée dans ce dossier. Son deuxième point principal était 
la, le manque de fiabilité de l'écriture ou de, de l'analyse graphologique. En particulier, il, il, il nous expliquait que cette affaire est fondée sur une analyse graphologique majoritairement non fiable. Nous avons des preuves accablantes pour montrer son manque de fiabilité. On a vu ça à plusieurs reprises durant le procès. C'est la troisième tentative de la France à l'analyse de l'écriture. Deux tentatives précédentes étaient fondées sur, un, sur, une, sur un, un, un spécimen que quelqu'un d'autre a écrit. Mais le juge a quand même conclu que l'écriture à son correspond à celle du suspect ou qu'il y avait assez de raisons pour croire ceci. La troisième tentative suivante en conformité excusez, avec cette histoire de manque de fiabilité. Donc, on voit encore qu'il y a plusieurs questions, même le juge dit qu'il trouve l'analyse graphologique peu fiable, inclu, inclu, inconclusive. Donc, il, a dit ça, il a dit ça durant le procès et même aujourd'hui, il a répété ça. Mais il reste que à cause des problèmes qu'on a avec cette loi-là d'extradition, il a quand même accepté cette analyse-là. Même malgré le fait qu'on a eu plusieurs experts internationaux qui ont venu attester que l'analyse graphologique, la troisième et aussi les deux autres, était très peu fiable. En plus, le troisième point de M. Bain était qu'il y a une utilisation indéfendable de l'intelligence secrète ou des renseignements secrets dans ce dossier. Et lors du procès en France, le procureur utilisera ces renseignements secrets pour condamner Hassan. Personne ne sait d'où l'intelligence est, est venue. La France nous a dit ça durant le procès. Les problèmes sont que, premièrement, les preuves non fiables d'écriture seront utilisées en France comme des preuves. Et le second, que l'intelligence non défendable secrète sera utilisée en France pour le condamner. Et bon, maintenant, on va aller au prochain conférencier. Son nom est Donald Pratt. Next speaker's name is Donald Pratt. He's also a member of Asandia Support Team. Good afternoon. I want to begin by acknowledging the efforts of the legal team at Bain, Seller and Boxel. In particular, the support committee thanks Mr. Don Bain for his tireless <coughs> efforts and for going above and beyond the call of duty on countless occasions. Regarding the judge's decision today, let me be clear. I respectfully but firmly disagree. The handwriting evidence put forward by France, five words printed in simplistic block letters on a Paris hotel registration card, was obliterated by prominent expert witnesses. France could have ordered the extradition of anyone in this room based on those five words. Nonetheless, my good friend, Dr. Hassan Dia finds himself in a position little different from that of a convicted criminal. Hassan's liberty is severely restricted by detention and house arrest. And now we come to the sentence I hope I wouldn't have to say. <coughs> now that his bail has been revoked, he is once again returned to the harsh confines of the detention center. Hassan's property is wiped out by a very protracted legal process. Hassan's reputation is indelibly stained with the terrorist label. By committing Hassan for extradition, the Canadian court places his fate in the hands of the Minister of Justice, who we fear will sign an order of surrender. Extradition will take Hassan from a process described by Gary Boddy, Canada's leading extradition authority, as the least fair process in Canadian law, to a process in France criticized by Human Rights Watch as incompatible with European and international human rights law. 
I can say that Hassan has shown tremendous courage and grace throughout this lengthy ordeal, which is far from over. Indeed, he remains the big-hearted person I have always known. Remarkably, Hassan demonstrates more concern for the well-being of those around him than for himself. These are the same traits that I have consist that have consistently marked his character since the day I met him more than two decades ago. <coughs> the examining magistrate calling the shots in France happily stood by the reports of his first two handwriting experts, which were erroneously based on the writing samples from an entirely different person. These reports, which apparently would have been acceptable at a French anti-terrorism court, turned out to be so awful that they had to be withdrawn from an extradition hearing. I personally have no doubt that those reports would be resurrected at a French trial. After much delay, France submitted a third handwriting report, which foremost experts in the field of handwriting analysis have declared to be patently and wholly unreliable. Nevertheless, the judge rested his committal decision today <coughs> on this one handwriting report. Canada's extradition law allows France to keep swinging and swinging and swinging at the ball until they hit it. And you certainly don't need to hit the ball out of the park. Just hit it hard enough to convince the umpire, the judge, that you could get to first base. And this is just the handwriting. What about the secret unsourced intelligence offered without any assurances that it is not the product of torture? What about the varying eyewitness descriptions of the suspect, all of which actually exclude Hassan? And what about the palm and fingerprints that do not match Hassan? This so-called evidence, all of it put forward by a magistrate that a French anti-terrorism court must presume has conducted his investigation in an impartial and unbiased manner, has no place in a court of law. If any of this will be accepted at trial in France, then please, please don't tell me that Hassan will get a fair trial in France. Since day one, Hassan has always maintained that this is a case of mistaken identity. For the longest time, French investigators were absolutely convinced that the man they were looking for was a Palestinian to the point where they insisted that Hassan, who is Lebanese, must be Palestinian. Once they, it finally dawned on French investigators that, they had, that the glove did not fit, they simply remade the glove time and time again to fit the man. Mistaken identity continues to be the thread that runs through the history of this case. From the palm and fingerprints that exclude Hassan, to the wildly inconsistent physical descriptions of the suspect that in any case also exclude Hassan, to the ridiculous handwriting analysis which evokes memories of the infamous Dreyfus affair. In closing, let me repeat my ironclad belief that Dr. Hassan Diab is an innocent man. The support committee will stand with Hassan as he carries his fight to the Court of Appeals where we hope the Charter of Rights and Freedoms and Canadian sovereignty will receive forceful reaffirmation. Thank you. Thank you, Donald. Merci. Alors, encore une fois, je vais juste faire une petite compte rendu uh, avant le dernier conférencier et en, avant la, la vidéo l'énoncé vidéo de Hassan. Donc, <coughs> M. Pratt nous a dit que un expert de premier plan sur l'extradition ici au Canada, Gary Botting, appelle la loi sur l'extradition du Canada le procès juridique le moins juste au Canada. Et c'est une citation d'un livre qu'il a écrit dernièrement. <coughs> Et M. Pratt, qui connaît Hassan depuis au-dessus de 20 ans, nous a dit que depuis 
le début de ce procès juridique en 2008, Hassan démontre du courage et aussi une bonne humeur. Souvent aussi, il exprime sa préoccupation pour le bien-être des autres, avant même le sien, des traits, des caractéristiques, des qualités de persévérance vraiment qui ont toujours été là avec lui depuis que M. Pratt le connaît. Et enfin, il a donné des exemples de preuves qui ont été présentées en cours qui ne correspondent pas du tout et en effet qui exclut Hassan comme étant euh, le coupable dans ce cas ici. Donc, une de ces preuves-là, c'est les descriptions physiques. Les descriptions physiques qui ne sont pas du tout consistantes avec la description d'Hassan. Et c'est des preuves qui n'ont jamais été présentées en cours, parce que sous la loi de l'extradition du Canada, on n'a pas à dévoiler toutes les preuves. Donc, il y a, il y a ces descriptions physiques-là des témoins en 1980 qui rendraient que Hassan aujourd'hui aurait au-dessus de 70 ans, qui n'est pas le cas. En plus, il y a les empreintes digitales et palmaires de paume qui ne correspondent pas aux empreintes de Hassan. Et cette enquête-là a été menée par la GRC ici au Canada pour la République française. Donc encore une fois, d'autres preuves qui ne correspondent pas à Hassan et qui l'excluent. Donc, M. Pratt a terminé en disant que le comité de soutien de Hassan va continuer à lutter pour prouver son innocence et aussi qu'on a hâte à une chance de présenter notre cas dans les cours d'appel. Donc, finalement, on va avoir le dernier conférencier qui s'appelle Matthew Barron. Um, so, we have the last speaker before the video statement by Hassan, and his name is Matthew Barron, who is a member of the support committee. Thank you, Matthew. First of all, I'd like to say that today's decision should be a wake-up call for all of us uh, here in Canada, because under Canada's extradition laws, any of us could be in Dr. Hassan Diab's shoes right now, and he is in those shoes at the Ottawa Detention Centre behind bars deprived of his liberty, because under extradition, we will sacrifice your charter rights in the interest of maintaining a good diplomatic relation with the country that is seeking your extradition. Needless to say, there will be an appeal of this decision. It's also important to point out that this has nothing really in the end to do with the law and everything to do with politics and with fear. Any Muslim who has been wrongly fingered at an airport or on the job or at a traffic stop or thrown in jail on vague suspicions can no doubt relate to what their Dr. Diab is currently going through. Let's look at this very clearly. Dr. Diab's fingerprints do not match the suspects. His palm prints do not match the suspects. The physical description does not match the suspects. And the handwriting does not match, according to leading international experts. And in addition, imagine being in his shoes with all of these cards stacked against you. The judge said the following today. He accepts the government of Canada's position that, quote, in an extradition case, there is no responsibility upon a requesting state to provide full disclosure of all of its evidence. So France can be sitting on truckloads of exonerating evidence which would show that Hassan Diab is innocent and it is privileged to withhold that from the Canadian court and from Mr. Diab further upsetting his life. That is the state of Canada's extradition law, and that is the situation under which Dr. Diab faces potential life imprisonment in France under the very unfair uh, trial practices that have been described by Mr. Bain and Mr. Pratt. It should also be noted that France does not allow the extradition of its citizens to the country of Canada. Now, we're all too familiar with the cases of wrongful convictions in this country. 
uh, that use Canadian standards of evidence, this is clearly a wrongful extradition that does not even allow Canadian standards of evidence. And I think it's important, especially for the media, those of you who were shut out of this morning's hearing by the police, unfortunately, that this is exactly what the judge said. He said, quote, the case presented by the Republic of France against Mr. Diab is a weak case. The prospects of conviction in the context of a fair trial seem unlikely. However, it matters not that I hold this view. The law is clear that in such circumstances, a committal order is mandated. I would beg to differ with the judge because the law is not clear, or at least as clear as he has stated this morning, because his very own decision quotes the Supreme Court of Canada in the lead extradition case, Ferris, which states the following. I take it as axiomatic that a person could not be committed for trial for an offense in Canada if the evidence is so manifestly unreliable that it would be unsafe to rest a verdict upon it. Remember how earlier he said it's unlikely to have a verdict in France? Well, here we're talking about the Supreme Court of Canada saying it follows that if a judge on an extradition hearing concludes that the evidence is manifestly unreliable such that it would not lead to a verdict on the other side, then that case cannot proceed. So you can see that the judge here is clearly caught in the extradition law and in the very limited role that he has to play. Our other major concern with this process is the fact that now that the individual who initiated this process, the Minister of Justice, will now be receiving submissions from Dr. Diab's lawyers as to whether or not the extradition should finally go ahead, which is a conflict of interest. This is the individual who initiated the process. How on earth can they be objective when it comes to looking at the human rights considerations that will now be put forward uh, to try and stay this extradition? Um, this is especially crucial because as the Supreme Court of Canada has said in other extradition decisions, this in the end is a political decision in which the minister must take into account the requirements of good faith and the honor of Canada in responding to the request under an extradition treaty and must weigh the political and international relations ramifications of the decision whether or not to surrender. We don't hear about the individual's charter rights, we're just hearing about whether we should honor a treaty under which the standards are so low that any of us could be subjected to this. So what are we to make of the judge's case this morning? Like other cases that have been heard before extradition judges, it's clear that their hands are tied. He has proceeded by accepting handwriting evidence that he himself found, quote, very problematic very confusing and with suspect conclusions. In other words, he has played the role of a rubber stamp and the person sought can almost never win. And while we're very disappointed in this decision which will be appealed, we also recognize that judges often bound by unjust laws, whether they are convicting Rosa Parks for defying segregation or convicting women seeking the right to vote, a choice does and this morning did in fact exist. And it would have been our hope that this judge would have exercised his discretion under the Supreme Court ruling in Ferris to stay the extradition and show a bit more courage in granting the benefit of the very serious doubts he appears to have with respect to what is clearly a non-existent case made up by the French against Hassan Diab. In the meantime, we in the Hassan Diab Support Committee are calling upon people across this land to call the Minister of Justice, to write to the Minister of Justice and say it is time to put an end to this very unjust proceeding because the next person in the prisoner's box could be any one of us, it could be you, it could be me, indeed it could be the judge who ruled this morning. Monsieur Barron, selon encore une fois, je vais faire un petit compte rendu en français. Ensuite, on va voir la vidéo. Euh, C'est un énoncé de Hassan Dia, qui est en anglais, mais dans les, euh, les trousses d'informations qu'on a circulées avant, il y a une traduction en français.